Good evening, our guests, our church, youth. We have another great opportunity to be here. And before we head out to this week, working week and school week, we have another opportunity to read from the Word of God. And I have suggested to read two um, scriptures, one from Old Testament, one from New. Um, first one written in Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 4, 5, and 6 from New NIV version. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea and lightened the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into deep sleep. When I read that, reread that passage again, something just popped out in my conscience. I guess God, in a way, showed that how is it possible when there's a storm out of your boat and you go fall into a sleep? And it says not into regular sleep, but into a deep sleep. I remember a few years ago, we had a good opportunity with some of our brothers to get out for a fishing trip. And it was one of the times we were on a boat. The boat wasn't too big, about 40 feet, 45 feet boat. It was in New Jersey. The weather was really good. We had a great time. It was amazing. And we came back. It was a good experience. Sometime after, we said, let's try to do it again. And we went out again, and it was right after storm. We didn't realize what we were going for, but we already booked a trip, so we had to be out there. And I tell you what, it wasn't a great storm. The ship wasn't sinking, but all of us felt so horrible and sick. And after that, every time I hear about going there, I already feel that inside of me I'm like I don't know if I want to go and we read here that it was a great storm the ship was about to sink but he went down I guess it had certain levels in the ship and he fell deep asleep and God talked to to my heart said Tim you know if we think of a church or family of your own salvation to be that great ship this world already, storm is so big, and our life, we can't be all the time inside the church only to give effect to the others that are around us. Second passage we're going to read from New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. It's a golden verses. In Russian, Zalatistihi. Um, those that we know from our childhood. And uh, Jesus was on a mountain with his disciples. And he was preaching to disciples. But we know that there were a crowd of people following him all the time. So there weren't only disciples, but there were a crowd of people listening to him talk and he starts saying verse 13 and 14 after he said certain things he said you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltness how can it be made salty again it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot verse 14 you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Now listen to this. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 
we live in a Christian country. And more than that, we live in a Christian world. Statistically, out of seven and a half billion of people, one billion is Christian, Christianity. That's what they say. So every seventh person, one, two, three, four, five, six, Christian, one, two, three, four, five, six, Christian. It's a great proportion, but do we see the world to be in that light? If it is how it says, it is. Back in the day, when, why Jesus said, you are the salt? Preventing, they did not have refrigerators. They, to prevent something, they had to salt something. So as the light, Jesus said, you are the light. He didn't say to his disciples, you were light yesterday, or you were light when you repented, when you got baptized. No, he said, you are the light today, present. Listen to this. Every third Christian says there are many ways to heaven. You guys ever heard that? I'll translate. Каждый третий христианин говорит, что в рай можно попасть разными дорогами. Every third Christian says there are many ways to heaven. Every third says don't tolerate me. Не воспитывайте меня. Don't change me. Я вот, I am who I am. Вот такой вырос. And every seventh is a, boor, is a Christian person. Think about this. If you take seven light bulbs and you take one and light it up, it's going to do so much light around seven that you don't light up. That's the proportion, but that doesn't happen. You know, years ago at the conference, one guy from Detroit, one of their youth leaders, he was saying the word, and he said a parable, said that often we Christians, we go catch fish from a fish tank. The fish that already been caught in the church. It's good, but I want to talk to those that are consider themselves as born again. If you're born again, if you're Christian, you know how it is. Jesus said we need to live in a way where others see our good deeds and glorify the Lord. So they could see how we live and they could see God through our lives, your and mine. Every year, we get a concert here at Bryce Jordan Center, Winter Jam. And we sometimes went with kids, and I enjoy Christian music, although not all. And you sit between thousands of people, thousands. It's crowded. Bryce Jordan Center is crowded. And we sing songs together. They worship together. But when we step out of there, it feels like we dissolve, we disappear. Where are we? Where are we today? If there's a storm out there, if people are sinking, we're often here in church. We like it because, you know, we're saved. Our kids, is, our kids with us. We come here on Sunday. We come here on Friday. But Jesus wants us to be disciples out there where we are. Not only when we go to missionary trip, not only when we go to Ukraine or Moldova or Russia or whatever it is, where we go, Thailand. He wants us to be disciples here in State College. I want to talk about a few reasons why often it doesn't happen in our lives. Because we read that when you light up a candle, light, you don't put it underneath a basket or underneath a bowl. What's the point to light something up if you're going to cover it? And what causes that cover often is our fear. We're fear, fearful. We're fearful to say to our boss, you know, you're, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. We're fearful to tell somebody when they're saying bad words, when they swear, we're, uh, okay, maybe tomorrow he's going to be better, or, you know. I'm going to pass it by. We're fearful of them thinking of us, of knowing that you're a Christian. Oh, I'm going to lose my job. Does all of our students that go to college, hey, does all of your friends know you're Christian? 
Can you testify? Can you let them know, hey, you know, you can't live this lifestyle. There's heaven or hell. You know, there's consequences after what you're doing. Why are we afraid of losing our job? We don't believe that. God's going to give us a new one. So there's that fear. Fear of offending somebody. Often in this world right now, we don't want to offend anybody. You don't even want to say, you know, I don't want to offend that person. Back in the day, there was no offending. What is offending? You tell a person how it is. We feel uncomfortable. We like, we, often we talk to those that we love. Often we talk to those people that we're comfortable with. Our neighbors. You know, if I like my neighbor that lives to the right, I'm going to talk to him about Jesus Christ. And if I don't really like my neighbor that lives to my left, I might not do so. We have to do it. Right? It says in the world, in the word, what's good to love those that only love us back? We need to testify to show them love through our good deeds, even those who don't love us. No, reason number one, fear. Reason number two is not knowing the word. I catch myself so many times. I pray, God, I want to know the word. I want to start to remembering the word. You remember jokes that people told you 20 years ago. And they stuck in your head. But you read Matthew. You read Acts. Paul went here and there. And it flies away from your head. You see something on TV or on news. You remember constantly. And you're like, we have to know the word. On the radio... Um, a few months ago uh, on Rev FM, they were saying, this generation of young people right now in the United States, if we're counting back from pilgrims when they moved to America, it's the most weakest generation that know in the world, word of God, Slova. We don't know it. Young people don't know the word. How can you testify to somebody if you don't know Bible? Reason number three is a sin. What can cause that light not to be shining? You don't cover that light. If you have unconfessed sin, it often causes as a cap for the light. You can't shine to others. You can't go talk to them. As we heard our pastor preach this morning, people look at us. They know how we come, how we dress up, what we eat, what we like, what sports we play, what music we listen to. They know our hobbies and everything. They know if we live a sinful lifestyle, we need to be example. We need to shine. We need to light up. And reason number four is that we often don't pray to God asking those things. You know, I catch myself that um, like I want to testify to somebody. And when you start praying, God sends you those people. Well, test that in your life. Try that. Try, pray the prayer. God, send me somebody where I can testify your name. You know, sometimes we're shy to walk up to somebody and to talk to them about Jesus Christ. We're shy because we're young or because our English is not too great. Look at me here. How many <laughs> grammar mistakes I made today already, right? And devil tell you those things, you know. Oh, you know, listen, just relax. Sit down. Everything good. Somebody else is going to do so. You have to step over that barrier. We have to testify. I remember when we were on mission trip, out on Kamchatka, and um, we had a group that were singing songs with us from Walla Walla, Washington, with two sisters and a brother. And we had evening where they were singing songs, and the preacher was supposed to say the word, and we had invitation cards, so we had to pass them out on the street before that evening happened. And I remember I was 16 years old at the time, and I stayed there at the sidewalk, busy, busy street, people walking, it's in the town in Petropavlovsk, Kamchatka, I see youth coming, guys, girls, and I'm shy to give them the invitation. 
I'm shy. I'm like, you know what they're going to think of me. I'm going to invite them to church. And then you step back and you pray, you know. If a gr grandma's walking, no problem. If a great, great grandmother walking, you're like, you know, come visit our, you know, we have a great concert today and everything. If a young people, you feel uncomfortable. You don't want to be that white raven or whatever you want to say. You want to be like normal. We need to pray that God sends us those people. About a few weeks ago, I said, God, help me testify your name to somebody. Send me somebody that I could testify your name. Uh, it was a busy day, and after all, we stopped at the Flying J, and I was grabbing my lunch, and I sat down at a, at a, at a Denny's at the breakfast bar to take a food, and my wife called me right away. And she called me, and I have a bunch of guys sitting beside me, and I said, you know, honey, I'm going to call you back in two minutes because I'm going to eat my breakfast. And I said it in Russian. And I hang up, and the guy beside me starts talking to me in Russian. He's like, you know, he's like, where are you from? You know, how do you know <laughs> where you, you know, where are you originally from, from Russia? Or he's from Georgia. He's a Georgian, Gruzin, right? His name was Irakili. I remember that. And I'm like, okay, here's opportunity. Me and him, we're going to have breakfast together. We could talk about Jesus. What do you know? Always in front of you, they have a TV with news on, NSBC or Fox News or, you know, CNN. This time it was church. It was one of those mega churches, and one young pastor, he was performing miracle on somebody. So another guy, he's either blind or something, he walks up to him and he takes that clay, plastiline or glin or something, and puts on his eyes and praying over it. And it looks childish, it doesn't look real. That fake church or whatever you want to call it, it just... And he's sitting right here. He's like, you know, look at those Protestants. So much trouble because of them. They say one thing and do other thing. And I start talking to him. You know, I, you know I'm a Protestant. I'm a Baptist here. So I'm like sitting quiet like a mouse. I'm like, uh-oh. I'm like, how do you know about God? He's like, I'm, I'm Orthodox. Georgians, Armenians, Armeni, Gruzin, and you see Pravoslavni. He says, I'm Orthodox. And we start talking to him about this world, about how it is, how God wants us to be in the family, how he wants us to live a righteous life. And we have this great conversation for the last 20, 30 minutes. And at the end, I say, can I pray for you? He says, yes, pray for me. They never used to pray like we pray. So we bow our heads and, you know, and we pray. And I say, amen. He says, amen. And he puts the cross on himself. And he hugs me. He says, Tim, I was supposed to meet you. It was God sending you to me. I was such a bad day or whatever. I needed to talk to you. It was a good experience. Pray the prayer. God, please send me somebody that I could make a difference in their life. If you work at work, don't be shy of testifying God, testifying Jesus, what he does in your life, what he did in your life, if he did so. Years ago, when I just started working as a driver... And it was such a horrible market. I know it's really bad market right now for drivers. The drivers out there will understand me. And it was very tough to make money. Very tough. And my dispatcher, we had a good week. And he said, Tim, you got lucky. Because I have 11 other drivers. Nobody did this good how you did it. You got lucky. I said, Bogdan, he was one of those hardcore Ukrainians. Banderovitz. I'm going to Bogdan. I'm like, I didn't get lucky. God blessed me. There was a pause on the phone. He said, what do you mean God blessed you? I said, God, need, God knows my needs. He knows my heart. He knew I need this right now to pay for this, for this, for that. God blessed me. There was another pause. And he says, Tim, maybe God doesn't know about my needs. I said, Bogdan, what are your needs? Maybe we could pray for them. He tells me this story that he's been in America for two years and he's engaged, he's married to a girl that's still in Ukraine and he, she can't come. There are problems with his, their papers, with paperwork, and she can't come. So every God's given day, he's right there in front of those screens looking for loads and she's right there on the Skype with him talking. And he was saying that with his tears on his eyes. He says, maybe God doesn't know my need. I said, hey, maybe he doesn't. 
He says, can you pray for me? I said, yes, we can pray in church for your need. Usually I can't make Tuesdays for Bible study, but that week it was God made it happen. I was at the Bible study, and before we were having our Bible study, we have our needs, and we were praying about And pastor said, your needs. And I said, brothers and sisters, listen, this is a test for us. We can pray for my dispatcher. He's in that situation. About two months later, he calls me and says, Tim, tell thanks to church for those who were praying for me. She's already here in the United States. Slava Bogu. God can use you where you are. He can use you when you're in school, when you're at work. Those people that you interfere, your neighbors, don't be shy. Talk to them and live. We need to live to do good deeds. So it says when they see, they, could test, they, they can glorify the Lord by looking at our lifestyle. That's the wish on my heart. And Let's try to do that, and I think God will bless us so. Let's pray today. Amen.